Grandpa stole his first buggy in 1892. Uh, I met your grandma pig slopping in 46. Oh, every Christmas we'd visit my Uncle Fred in prison. And welcome to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. My name is Fisher. I am your radio root sleuth on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. And we have a real Navy Mariner kind of base show going on today. A lot of interesting stuff happening. We're going to be talking to Daphne Palmer Ginecopolis. She's written a book about pirates and their families and their wives and what their lives were like. In fact, you're going to find that pirates weren't quite the stereotype that you knew them as. We'll be talking to her in a little more than 10 minutes. And then later in the show, we're going to talk to a guy named Ray Weiss. And Ray has been researching his Mariner ancestors for decades and then traveling to the places that they sailed to. And in fact, he's getting ready to go see three more of them in the coming weeks. So we're going to talk to Ray about how this all got going, where he's been, what the experience has been like. It's going to be pretty fun. Plus, at the back end of the show, we're going to talk to our friend Melanie McComb from NEHG. GS about how you can track down your Navy ancestor from World War II and his uh, naval records. There's a lot of great detail in that stuff. You're going to want to hear that. Hey, just a reminder, if you haven't signed up for our weekly Genie newsletter yet, you got to do it. It's absolutely free. Make sure you get all the stories that you'll need as a genealogist to stay caught up on what's going on. Catch my blog and, of course, links to past and present podcasts. Right now, it's off to Boston to talk to David Allen Lambert, the chief genealogist for the New England Historic Genealogist. Society and AmericanAncestors.org. David, how you doing? I'm doing great. And to Isior Danilovich, born in Amsterdam, New York, on December 9th, 1916, happy 103rd. Might not mean anything to you, but if I told you Spartacus and Isior's real stage name is Kirk Douglas. Kirk Douglas, 103 this week. That's unbelievable. It really is. All right, let's get going with our family histoire news. Where do you want to start? Now, the big story right now is, of course, the acquisition of GEDmatch, which has been in the news. And many of you, of course, have a GEDmatch account and have uploaded your data. It has now been acquired by Verogen, a company out in California. And right now, it doesn't look like there's going to be any change to what it is. It looks like it's still going to be free. We'll just watch it over the next few months as things transpire. Yep, see how things evolve. Well, you know, one thing that's evolved really well is this work that has been done in Ireland to sort of reclaim the archive. Back in 1922, the four courts burned, and if you saw the movie Michael Collins with Liam Neeson years ago, you might have seen the bombing. Of course, the four courts had the archives, the census, the church records, the probates for Ireland. Most of them went up in flames. Now they're looking to reclaim them by looking at research that people did before 1922 or transcribed, or maybe a duplicate copy of something that was in another place in Ireland or in England or somewhere else. Isn't that amazing? And they say that they have found far more information that was lost in that by doing this technique than they ever imagined possible. And it's all going to come out in 2022 on the 100th anniversary of the bombing. Well, I'll tell you, my Lamberts are going to be searched high and low on that one because that's my biggest problem is that there's not a lot of early Irish records, and we came over in 1792, well before the famine. And and all this, by the way, is going to be indexed as well, so you're going to be able to research this in a way that nobody's ever been able to do it before. Well, I'll tell you, the next story we have to dig a little deep to find. Uh, Many of you may have photographs uh, of your ancestors in the Civil War. In in Camp Nelson, Kentucky, they've done some archaeology, and they've found a lot of hair dye bottles. Where our ancestors vain? No, it could be that their hair color was so light it would have looked washed out in a photograph. So it looks like before you had your picture done, you did your hair. Yeah, this was an amazing story. I had no idea that if you had light hair during the Civil War era, the picture would come out like really really white so they would dye their hair and this was all from this uh, camp extraction they were doing all kinds of digs at this camp nelson they also Mm -hmm. found for instance the name of the photographer 
carved out on a piece of metal that they found in this camp. Isn't that incredible? Yeah, it's like a stencil or something they yeah. probably would have used. It's a great calling card, and they've also found who the photographer was. There's an image of him in the article, which you can find on ExtremeGenes.com. I tip my hat to Dick Eastman, who always has some great ideas for our family history, our news. I use him from time to time, reading through his great newsletter, which has been going on for years. Nova Scotia reaching out to the general public, whether you're American or Canadian or wherever, about adoption records. They have adoption records, fish, that go over 100 years. In Canada, adoption records are locked down pretty tightly. So this might give a clue to other genealogists researching their roots. And if you go to ExtremeGenes.com, you can find all about it with a link to the Nova Scotia provincial government. And thank you, Dick Eastman, for that great story. I think we're seeing an awful lot of people now around the country in government taking another look at adoption ceilings. New York, of course, their governor just signed the adoption bill that was passed earlier this year by their assembly. So starting next month, adoptees who are adopted out in New York City and New York State can actually start applying to find out and obtain their original birth certificates, which is, you know, something that's just a basic right for everybody else. Hopefully we'll see more of that in the years to come. Well, coming up on our most extended family you never knew you had story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is it, isn't it? Uh, imagine being 92, never knowing much about your family because you were adopted, but then to find out you have 19 half-siblings. Yeah, this is in Michigan. This one family historian got going, and of course, through DNA, he discovered, oh, wait a minute, I've got a sibling, a sister. She's in her 90s, and now they've had this massive reunion with her, and nobody can believe it. It's amazing. Yeah, it's great. And of course, then there's the next two generations, maybe even three that have followed since. So it's a massive family, and she's having a really hard time getting her brain around it all because she's never known anybody. You know, I'm working on something similar right now. My wife's grandmother was adopted, and uh, we don't know who her natural father is. And through DNA and working with Chris Child, he's pretty much determined down to three families. So I'm excited. Cool. Yeah, i got to get some more DNA from one of my wife's uncles to get some closer connections. Are you stuck in your holiday gifts? Well, you can save $20 on a membership to AmericanAncestors.org by using the coupon code EXTREME from Extreme Genes. Well, this is all I have from this side of the country for you today, my friend. Talk to you soon, and hope you're putting together your genealogical Christmas list for ancestors you hope to find under your tree. All right. Thank you so much, David. And coming up next, we're going to talk to Daphne Palmer Gina. She is the author of a book about pirates and their wives and their families and how they lived. It might just surprise you. Coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Genies, Fisher here, and the raves continue pouring in from family historians and genealogists everywhere for the photo app that you're going to want to have as soon as you get familiar with it. It's called Memory Web, and we've been talking about it on the show for some time now. It's a photo organizer built by family historians for family historians, and talk about a great gift. Yeah, you know, you can share photos with tag details visible on your photo. Yeah, you can tag pictures and say, oh, look, this is Uncle Jack. This is Aunt Fred. You can send photos with all the details inside the file as metadata, so you can hide it as well. And you can selectively share with your aunt so maybe she can identify people in a reunion picture from decades ago. Or you can actually connect to see where your grandfather served in World War II with an interactive world map. And you can get a 10% discount off an annual subscription when you sign up at memoryweb.me slash extreme genes. Bring your digital archive alive with Memory Web. Have you hit a brick wall in your family tree? Are you unsure how to use your DNA test results to resolve a research question? Do you want to travel where your ancestors walked and need to find details before you go? Need help joining a lineage society? Whatever your genealogy research question, the answer is Legacy Tree Genealogists. Legacy Tree Genealogists has been helping clients all over the globe discover their story since 2004. Legacy Tree has carefully selected and trained professionals who specialize in hundreds of countries and languages, as well 
well as probate research and DNA analysis. And when you need experts on the ground in the countries where your ancestors came from, Legacy Tree Genealogist calls upon its global network of on-site researchers who know the local language and how to get their hands on the records you need. Legacy Tree Genealogist is the world's highest client-rated genealogy research firm and is recommended by genealogy industry leaders worldwide, including MyHeritage, 23andMe, and more. Request your free quote today at LegacyTree.com. That's LegacyTree.com. Thanks to technology, discovering your family's story is easier than ever. You can discover yours at Roots Tech, the world's largest family history conference. Register today for Roots Tech 2020. Don't miss this incredible four-day event, February 26th through 29th. Learn from over 300 classes on topics such as DNA, capturing family stories, and preserving legacies. You'll also enjoy daily celebrity keynote speakers. Use promo code HOLIDAY and get your four-day pass for only $169. That's $130 off a regularly priced pass. Discover your family. Discover yourself. Discover your roots at Roots Tech, the world's biggest family history, genealogy and DNA event, February 26th through 29th at the Salt Palace in Salt Lake City. Register today at rootstech.org. That's rootstech.org. And welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth and pirate descendant. And today we have a real seafaring flavor to the show with a couple of great guests, starting out with Daphne Palmer Genicopolis. And uh, Daphne is the author of a book called The Pirate Next Door, The Untold Story of 18th Century Pirates, Wives, Families, and what else? I can't turn that many pages, Daphne. <laughs> This is communities. Communities. I couldn't even read my own writing there. This is like a 300-page title before we even get to anything else. It's like as long as your name. Amazing. <laughs> Welcome to Extreme Genes. It is great to have you, and I'm very interested in all you've got going with this because I think there are a lot of people who descend from pirates and privateers, and it really all kind of fits into the same category, don't you think? Uh, yes. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> sort of. Of course, one was a little more legal than the other, but uh, nonetheless, it was the same type of person. But, you know, being a pirate descendant myself, I'm fascinated with the idea. For instance, in my case, I have a, a pirate who married a Puritan, the great granddaughter of one of the Mayflower passengers, John Howland. And it's just kind of a head scratcher to me that a, a Puritan woman would marry uh, such an old salt who had committed a lot of well, shall we say, who had had a lot of adventures on the high seas. I mean, they did some nasty things, and yet these were supposedly pure Christian people. How did that come together? How did that happen that way? Well, she may not have known that he was a pirate, and he may not have started out as a pirate. He could have started out as a sailor on a privateering vessel, and he thought that he was just going out to do the king's bidding, of capturing the king's enemy ships and mm -hmm. cargo. Often what happens on privateering vessels is that once they get out to sea, the men change their mind about sharing their loot and turn <laughs> pirate so they can keep it all for themselves. So your Puritan ancestor may not have known mm -hmm. uh, that he was on a pirate ship, and he may not have known at first either. Although there are the other cases where men sign up knowing that they are going to be on a pirate ship and they know what they're getting into. But I suspect maybe your ancestor didn't know that he was going to be that. Well, he didn't start that way. You are right. He actually came out of England and he was on a, on a ship, a privateering ship that wound up in Spain. And then they were being held there, and it, it, it's a long, drawn-out story. But there are a lot of these wives who did marry these pirates knowingly, right? Some of them did. Some of them did not. Like I say, some of them turned pirate once they're out at sea. And the reason my book is called The Pirate Next Door is that you didn't really know who was going to be a pirate and who wasn't going to be a pirate. Hmm. Your neighbor may have started out as just a regular guy and then ended up being on a vessel that turned pirate, and he comes back and he's a pirate. It was just men who went to sea. They were mariners who needed jobs, 
And it turned out to be something much different. And the wives were women back home who were keeping everything going in the home nest. And they were raising the children alone and participating in the community, but they didn't have any money coming in. So a lot of these women suffered terribly from lack of funds because when a man went out on a pirateering job, it may or may not pan out. Mm-hmm. that they caught any enemy ships and captured any cargo. So it was risky business. And for a pirate ship, if he was on a pirate ship, he may very well have succumbed to disease and died. And fortunately, on pirate ships, they were very well organized. They were a democratic, self-contained community with rules called articles, and they provided health insurance and retirement plans and death benefits. Wow, really? Yes, Something we can learn from pirates. Yes. Well, they were they were very democratic. They, every man got a vote. And for the women back home, if their husbands died in the line of duty, his share of the booty was smuggled back to her so that she could have his share of the loot. And what kind of hints do you have sometimes if a wife was a pirate wife? Are there clues that show up in records anywhere? Because a lot of that loot had to be hidden, right? It was hidden. There are no clear records that say that she had an extra 160 pieces of aid in her pocket. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen that before, though, where there was some indication basically in the uh, inventory of her estate? No, I have not. Captain Kidd's wife, Sarah, there's some documentation about her where she is struggling with the authorities because Captain Kidd was imprisoned in Boston for piracy, and they came in and they took all her clothing and seized her personal belongings like her silver plate and her porringer and her tankard and her cash. That money was her own money, not from Captain Kidd's treasure. It was her own money. It was very hard to decipher what was what, what belongs to who. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I bet that would be very difficult. So they just lived normal lives. What parts of the country did you mostly find these? In New England? Yes. I focused on two pirates from New York, Captain Kidd and Samuel Burgess, and one from Rhode Island, and one from Cape Cod, who was Captain Samuel Bellamy. And the one from Rhode Island was actually from Block Island. His name was Paul Grave Williams. And he is actually the one who first gave me the hint that pirates had wives because I'm a journalist and I was writing an article for the New York Times about a pirate museum on Cape Cod called the Wida Pirate Museum. And when I was reading the primary source documents about the Wida Pirates, there was a deposition from a captured pirate that said that he had been on the ship that had veered off course to go to Block Island so that the pirate captain, who was Paul Grave Williams, could go and visit his mother and three sisters. So imagine this, a pirate ship loaded with pirates and stolen booty, turning off and pulling into the harbor of Block Island in Long Island Sound and getting off to go say hi to mom and his sister. (laughs) That doesn't fit the stereotype, the image, does it? It does not. And so that kind of led you to a whole new line of research. It did. I never really thought of pirates as other than what I had read in books and movies as one-dimensional characters. But that really opened my eyes to the fact that pirates were not just sea monsters, but these were men, three-dimensional characters who cared about their families. Now, what areas did uh, he raid as a pirate? The Red Sea? Uh, Paul Grave Williams raided the Caribbean. Okay. Captain Kidd was in the Red Sea, and the other two, Sam Bellamy, were in the West Indies and the Caribbean. And Samuel Burgess is a very interesting fellow in Chapter 4. He's another one who shed light on the pirates' wives because he was a merchant captain who turned pirate, and he worked for a New York merchant named Frederick Phillips, running kind of a commuter service between New York and Madagascar. (laughs) Wow. Which is on the east coast of Africa. And what he did was he brought a cargo full of daily needs that the pirates needed down in Madagascar, like combs and thread and needles to mend their sails and shoes and hats and rum and wine and beer and limes to prevent scurvy. 
And they sold these provisions to the pirates down in Madagascar at a real premium price. But on the way back, he brought back pirates who had had enough of the pirate life and wanted to retire. And so he would bring back a dozen or more of pirates who would pay 100 pieces of eight and provide their own food and drink and take them back into New York. And these pirates would assimilate back into 18th century society. Wow. But in addition, Samuel Burgess carried the pirate's mailbag. And it's in the pirate's (laughs) mailbag. You just don't think of things like this with pirates. Retirement accounts, mailbags, taxi service. That's incredible. (laughs) Exactly. And it's in the pirate's mailbag because Samuel Burgess was captured by a British privateer. And he, his men, his ship, and his mailbag were all turned over to the British authorities, and the mailbag was deposited in the Admiralty records in London. And those records are available, and I read them and transcribed 250 of them, and many of them are from the pirates' wives to their pirates and the pirates to their wives. And what a great identifying record for this as well. Right. That's incredible. And so what year was that? That was 1694 to 1699. So this is like the golden age, right? Henry Every and and all those groups. That's correct. Wow. It was a very, very organized, sophisticated system. And the pirate's mailbox was on Ascension Island, which was in the Atlantic. It was a tiny little island that mariners would stop at because it was rich in turtles. And they would collect turtles for food and put them on their decks. But at a little spot in the harbor, there was a rock with a hole in it. And that's where they would leave their letters to go home. And and no flag and no skull and crossbones on the side of it. No, (laughs) no. Wow. I mean, you're just painting some amazing pictures here, Daphne, and I'm absolutely astounded by it. I'm really looking forward to reading it. And where can people get this book? So this book is on Amazon, and it's also on barnesandnoble.com on their website. Okay, and the book is The Pirate Next Door, The Untold Story of 18th Century Pirates, Wives, Families, and Communities. And uh, Daphne Palmer Genicopoulos is our guest today. And uh, Daphne, thank you so much for your time. This is just absolutely amazing. It really paints a different picture in my mind about my own ancestor. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure to speak with you, Scott. Thanks very much. And coming up next, we're going to talk to a man named Ray Weiss. And Ray has been researching his seafaring ancestors, finding out where they went, and then traveling to those places. And he's just got like three more to go out of like three dozen. It's going to be a fascinating visit coming up in five minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chartmasters' option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chartmasters today at FamilyChartmasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chartmasters will give the greatest care to your family history. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. 
ZapTheGrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. Hey, we are back at it on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And as you know, I love finding stories of people connecting to their ancestors. And the way they go about it is a little different from person to person. And Ray Weiss is on the line with me right now from Rockville, Maryland. Ray, can I reveal your age here? Because you're an amazing man. (laughs) Certainly. He is 80 years old and has taken a great interest in his seafaring ancestors. Uh, How much work have you done on this uh, research, Ray? Oh, hours and hours from starting in 2002 and right up to as recently as yesterday. Oh, wow. And how many seafaring ancestors do you have, and where are they from mostly? These are all on my mother's side of the family and are from Massachusetts and particularly New Bedford, Massachusetts, which is a former whaling capital of the U.S. and Nantucket. Okay, and how far back do you go with your seafarers? Uh, The first one that I can verify was a captain and was actually whaling was 1702. Okay, and who was that? His name was John Butler. One of the reasons that I got interested in this issue is that my middle name is Butler, based on my mother's ancestry and the fact that she had an interest in this family name. To think about this, most of us will research our ancestors, maybe take up an interest like this, but you, Ray, have figured out all the different destinations these seafaring ancestors went to, and you've been visiting them, which is amazing. How many years have you been visiting these seafarers' destinations? Uh, The first one was back in the early 2000s, and the most recent one was this past May. And next week, I am destined to go to New Zealand again and see the last three that I can uh, define. That you've identified. And uh, validate. So you have researched these ancestors. How many seafaring ancestors do you figure you have? Well, I've verified that 24 are at least, quote, mariners, unquote, in some mm-hmm. record. And 19 of them were whalers, of which uh, 16 were whaler ship captains. And these are either direct ancestors or brothers of a female direct ancestor. And so you did all this research, and then you started keeping track of where all they went. And you obviously followed it all out on a map. And then when did you get this incredible idea that I want to go to these places and see what they saw? The very first one that I started searching for was a great times three grandfather by the name of Peter Butler. And my mother had family records that Peter Butler fell from the mast on a whaling ship and broke, quote, every bone in his body and died. Okay. This was an interesting fact, and I said, I wonder what ship that was and under what circumstances. So I set about validating that information, and it took me about five years of off and on work, but I finally found the ship's log that recorded that information, and I have the exact date that happened. It was the 30th of July in 1832, when the ship of which his son, Peter Butler Jr., was the captain. And he was about 60 years old and apparently was along for the ride and was up on the mast in the crow's nest looking for whales near the island of Fayal. 
in the Azores when he slipped and fell. And the log says he hit the deck and lived, quote, three hours. His son, the captain of that voyage, then took him to that island and they buried him there. Oh, what a sad story. But did you go to that island? Oh, yes. I've been there twice and had to go again because I found a new lead that might allow me to find a burial site. And both times I struck out. They might have just buried him in any old convenient place for all I know. Sure. That's incredible. And where was this again? The island of Fayal. That's the island. And the town is Horta in Portuguese, H-O-R-T-A. Okay. And that was a very favorite whaling stop for ships from New Bedford. That's incredible. That's incredible. Where else have you been? You mentioned you've been to 32 places out of 35. What were some of the more unique places you visited? Yes, the other three I'll start visiting next week in New Zealand and one in two in New Zealand and one in Australia. Okay. Some very unusual places are Tristan da Cunha, which is the most isolated inhabited island in the world. It's 900 miles straight west of Cape Town, South Africa, in the Atlantic Ocean, and um, there are about 270 inhabitants there. Okay. And did they have any history to share with you? Uh, No. (laughs) But I have uh, verification that one of the two direct ancestors, male ancestors, not just a a great uncle times three or four or what have you, stopped there. And the most recent direct ancestor was a great grandfather, and he stopped there too. Wow. Another one uh, is a country that very few Americans have ever heard of. It's called Nauru, N-A-U-R-U. It's an island in the South Pacific Ocean that is an independent country all by itself, a member of the U.N., too. So how do you get to all these places? I'm assuming you're not a mariner yourself. You're not sailing off around the world. Are you flying there? (laughs) Yes, I did to Nauru. It's hard to get to, but I did. To Tristan de Cunha, and another place is St. Helena Island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. The only way you can get there to uh, both of them is by ship, and these trips were on cruise ships that happened to stop at these islands. Oh, wow. So you were able to plan it out and go, okay, I'm going to take that particular cruise. Oh, yes, absolutely. Now, do you travel alone? Do you have somebody to go with you? Uh, My wife has gone with me on some of these trips, but she doesn't like to travel, so most of them have been by myself. Okay. What an incredible experience. So how often do you make a new discovery? Because you you said you were researching as recently as yesterday. What else have you found? One thing that I've used to validate where the ship stop is, the website jennyalgebank.com, sure. which has newspaper articles. Yes, they do. The newspapers in New England used to keep detailed information about Ship X went sailing on a whaling voyage on the, a certain date with the captain being so-and-so. And that's been a valuable source of information because many of the logs for these voyages have disappeared over the years. And some of the voyages, I do have access to logs in the museums in uh, New Bedford, Massachusetts. So I can read the log and know exactly where they were. It's incredible. He's Ray Weiss. He's in Rockville, Maryland. He's 80 years old. He's been to 32 different places. Seafaring ancestors have gone on their voyages. And he's got three more. And you're leaving next week. Where are you going again? New Zealand for two of them and an island off the coast of Australia for the third one. And and that that will complete all all 35. That's it. What are you going to do after that? (laughs) I'm getting a little old, so maybe I will quit traveling internationally, (laughs) which is a favorite hobby of mine. Okay, Ray. Well, God bless and have a great time. And we look forward to hearing about your adventures. Thank you. Ask Us Anything is coming up next on Extreme Genes. Have you
Have you hit a brick wall in your family tree? Are you unsure how to use your DNA test results to resolve a research question? Do you want to travel where your ancestors walked and need to find details before you go? Need help joining a lineage society? Whatever your genealogy research question, the answer is Legacy Tree Genealogists. Legacy Tree Genealogists has been helping clients all over the globe discover their story since 2004. Legacy Tree has carefully selected and trained professionals who specialize in hundreds of countries and languages, as well as probate research and DNA analysis. And when you need experts on the ground in the countries where your ancestors came from, Legacy Tree Genealogist calls upon its global network of on-site researchers who know the local language and how to get their hands on the records you need. Legacy Tree Genealogist is the world's highest client-rated genealogy research firm and is recommended by genealogy industry leaders worldwide, including MyHeritage, 23andMe, and more. Request your free quote today at LegacyTree.com. That's LegacyTree.com. Genies, Fisher here, and the raves continue pouring in from family historians and genealogists everywhere for the photo app that you're going to want to have as soon as you get familiar with it. It's called Memory Web, and we've been talking about it on the show for some time now. It's a photo organizer built by family historians for family historians, and talk about a great gift. Yeah, you know, you can share photos with tag details visible on your photo. Yeah, you can tag pictures and say, oh, look, this is Uncle Jack. This is Aunt Frida, you can send photos with all the details inside the file as metadata, so you can hide it as well. And you can selectively share with your aunt, so maybe she can identify people in a reunion picture from decades ago. Or you can actually connect to see where your grandfather served in World War II with an interactive world map. And you can get a 10% discount off an annual subscription when you sign up at memoryweb.me slash extreme genes. Bring your digital archive alive with Memory Web. Thanks to technology, discovering your family's story is easier than ever. You can discover yours at Roots Tech, the world's largest family history conference. Register today for Roots Tech 2020. Don't miss this incredible four-day event, February 26th through 29th. Learn from over 300 classes on topics such as DNA, capturing family stories, and preserving legacies. You'll also enjoy daily celebrity keynote speakers. You Use promo code HOLIDAY and get your four-day pass for only $169. That's $130 off a regularly priced pass. Discover your family. Discover yourself. Discover your roots at Roots Tech, the world's biggest family history, genealogy, and DNA event, February 26th through 29th at the Salt Palace in Salt Lake City. Register today at rootstech.org. That's rootstech.org. Org. And it is time once again for Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's family history show at ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And today we have Melanie McComb on from the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org to answer your question. And the question we have today, Melanie, is from Kalen McCormick. He is in Atlanta, Georgia. And he says that he had some ancestors who were in World War II in the Navy and was wanting to know about finding naval records records. And I know you know a lot about this. I know the Army records aren't out there, though, because of that horrible fire back in St. Louis in the 70s. Right, that's correct. With the fire in 73, a lot of the files were burnt in the Army and Air Force files. There are some being recovered, but you're right, largely um, they're not all intact. But the naval records and the Marine records, those did survive, though. So those can be obtained from the National Archives in St. Louis, and they have the personnel uh, service records that can be requested. And they give a lot of great information about anybody that served in those areas. You know, I had two uncles that served in the Navy during World War II, one in the Pacific, one in the Atlantic, and I've just started recently researching. And through a company called Golden Arrow Research, I was able to obtain the records of my Uncle Don, who was on the cruiser New Orleans, and he was in the Battle of Midway, and there was Okinawa and Guam and Guadalcanal, and I had no idea and neither did his kids. And everything that was in there was just amazing detail. There were his original records from when he enlisted on December 8th, 
1941, the very wow. next day he signed up. And I guess it didn't become official till like the 19th. And they showed his physical records and any unusual marks. I didn't know he had a birthmark on his leg. And <laughs> He had some issues with his hands and some things that they didn't have any problem with. And he was in the service there for uh, three years, saw tremendous action. In fact, his ship lost the bow from a torpedo shot wow. by the Japanese in a battle on November 30th of 1942, and 180 of his shipmates were lost at that time. And we'd always heard this, but here was the account now in the records. And then I was also able to find a book that was written by one of his shipmates about his experience on the same ship at the same time, which provided a lot of color that I wasn't able to get anywhere else. But you know what? The coolest thing in this whole thing was, was the picture of him on the day that he enlisted. That's wonderful that you can find that because you cause sometimes finding those pictures are, are not always found in the, in, in the service records. So if you can find them, that, that's that's wonderful. Yeah, it's a pretty rare thing. It was a, a pretty great thing. I was just amazed. They showed what battle stars he was allowed to wear after certain activities. It showed what his occupation was, what his responsibilities were in his civilian work before he signed up. I mean, they got into so much detail. Who was going to be the next of kin to receive any benefits? Should he be killed in action? Something like that. And that changed because he got married during the war. And you could see where he lived and uh, and then what they assigned him to do. And it, there's actually an entire sheet that's just devoted to his rank at various times. And when it went that's up and, and actually when he got in a little trouble sometimes and it went down. <laughs> but you can see all of those things as well. But if you can get a hold of those through uh, the St. Louis uh, Record Depository, that's a great way to go. And I will say that Golden Arrow did an amazing job for me, very prompt. They charge between 75 and and $100, depending on the size of the file, which generally you don't know going in. But this was like 80 pages. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, definitely. Those records don't disappoint. That They give you such a great profile and breakdown of everything that they were working on um, when, in, in, during their service. Yeah. And now I've ordered uh, the second one on my uncle that was serving in the Atlantic and to find out exactly what he was doing there. So... Uh, that's a great way to go. Great question, Kalen. Thanks so much for it, and good luck in your research on that. And uh, coming up next, we'll have another question on Ask Us Anything with Melanie McComb when we return in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chartmaster's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chartmasters today at FamilyChartmasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chartmasters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multi Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to transferduplication.com. Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family 
family history research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities. And it's free. Sign up for the Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or the Extreme Genes Facebook page. And when you do, you'll receive David Allen Lambert's top 10 tips for beginning genealogists from the Chief Genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Sign up today for the Weekly Genie. All right, here we go. Our final segment this week on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. We're doing Ask Us Anything. It's your chance to ask your questions about how to find out about your ancestors. And we have an email here, Melanie from uh, Lane Portman from Cleveland, Ohio. And he says, I remember hearing that my ancestor was part of the effort to enforce prohibition. Is there anything out there that could help me find out more information on this? That is really interesting. I don't think I've ever heard that before. That is interesting. Yeah, so, 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 so someone's on the other side of the law this time. Right, so. right. This is the law enforcer, you know? Ah, yes. Are you and, aware and, of anything that could help him? Oh, yes, indeed. Yes. Yeah, so there are several different databases that are out there. One of them is in conjunction with the National Archives. There is a database for the identification card files of prohibition agents from 1920 to 1925. Oh, wow. What's in it? So you actually can see their card that has a photograph of the agent. Oh, wow. (laughs) Yeah, and these were some really stern-looking guys. They're going out and chasing all the bootleggers, and it it has their signature on their card basically saying that they're signing into service here. Wow, that's an incredible thing. So it's, it's the picture, it's their card, it's their signature. Is there anything else in there that tells the records of some of the busts they made or any of the cases they were involved in? It doesn't give the case files there, but there are case files at the National Archives. So depending on which area that they were serving in, whether they were on the the West or out in Chicago, they have the individual files for them. So if you ever really wanted to learn more about such characters like Capone, you could reach out to the National Archives in Chicago. The case studies, huh? Exactly. They have case files where they were tracking known crime leaders and known bootleggers throughout the area since they were breaking federal law transporting alcohol. So let's go through this then. So you can get the database with the pictures, and that's where? And that's on Ancestry. Ancestry's got that. See, I've never had any of my people show up in that one. I've never seen it. That's incredible. And then if you want to find out more about the agent, they can go through the National Archives? Correct, right. And you can see if they have any case files, uh, I think, during the time period. And maybe even see if the agents themselves, if there were any personnel records that were kept there. Largely, these agents were working under the Bureau of Internal Revenue, which was uh, the precursor of the IRS. So these were all federal huh. records that were taking place. How's the IRS get involved with alcohol? And Well, I guess they got the Bureau of Tobacco and Firearms now, which is probably a spinoff of this. Right, and and largely it was because they were transporting alcohol, usually over uh, federal lines, especially when they were importing and they were actually getting it over from Canada, like the the Canada whiskey, and bringing it in. Now it's becoming more of a commerce issue because now we're crossing all the way over the border to import alcohol, which was illegal at the time. You know, it is amazing to me the databases that are out there now that are coming out with photographs in them, such as the people who are getting their passports in the 19-teens, the pictures that are attached to those. I found one of my great uncle. There are no other pictures in existence of him, but we found that there. And uh, then there are the military records we talked about a few minutes ago. Now you've got this, the cards of these people who are enforcing prohibition. It makes you wonder what else is going to show up and land in our laps eventually that makes us go, wow. Oh, yes. And if you want to learn more about some of these busts that take place, also check out the newspapers in the areas where they were living, because a lot of times those busts would make it into the local news. All right. Thanks so much. She is Melanie McComb. She's with the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. And thank you to Lane for the question. Of course, if you have a question for us for Ask Us Anything, just email us at askusanything at extremegenes.com. Well, we've had quite the seafaring flavor to the show today. Thanks to my guests, Ray and Daphne, for sharing their stories, talking about pirates, and Ray, of course, pursuing the places his mariner ancestors went to, over 33 locations throughout his life. Unbelievable. If you missed any of the show or you want to catch it again, just listen to our podcast on iTunes, iHeartRadio, or ExtremeGenes.com, or wherever fine podcasts are found. Don't forget to sign up for our weekly Genie newsletter at ExtremeGenes.com. 
Bible.com. Talk to you next week. Thanks for listening. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. Family.